working on a proof of reserves project for taproot addresses. Proof of reserves is pretty important generally, especially now with what happened in the last couple of weeks. Um, if you do have your funds with the custodian, which we hope that you don't, you should have some transparency. Right now, you have no transparency. So um, uh, there's no support for taproot, so we worked on that with Chris.com. Yeah. Um, so there is this uh, function that's been in Bitcoin Core since like very early days called find message and verify message. Uh, but it has a lot of problems. Um, so the sign message implementation only works with legacy addresses. So you can't sign a message from a multi-sig address or SegWit version zero or one. Um, and even worse, the Bitcoin Core implementation is like super buggy. So even though this is a screenshot that I took from my Bitcoin Core, uh, gave it a totally legitimate SegWit address and said, all right, let's find this. And it gives me this obscure error message that says the address doesn't refer to a key, which is like not real, <laughs> an error. <laughs> so. <laughs> Clearly, this is uh, an aspect of Bitcoin Core that's been neglected for a long time. Um, and there's a lot of people that have noticed this uh, and some work's being done on it. Um, also, so, yeah. So you can verify messages from SegWit and MultiSig now, which is really just hacky. Like you have two specific service SegWit addresses um, or with SegWit signatures. It's not ideal. It's not part of a specification. So the objective with BIP322 is to uniform or unify the whole thing um, and, and follow proper specification. Yeah, so some of the motivation behind this is uh, there's like a lot of different use cases. Uh, the most obvious one is just proof of funds. Uh, so let's say you're a financial service company and you give out like Bitcoin backed loans. Maybe you want to know that your counterparty still has their Bitcoin. Uh, so you could challenge them to like sign a message from their Bitcoin wallet that shows that they still have their collateral. Um, proof of keys is also becoming more important now that we have like all this cool tapper stuff like Fediment and uh, side chains and, and multi sig stuff. So like, let's say you're in a federation and you want to make sure that everybody in the federation is actually maintaining their private keys for, for their share of it. Uh, right now, that's like kind of difficult to do without actually creating a legitimate transaction. Um, so there, there should be some way to like audit that members of the federation have, have their keys without actually having everybody sign a, a real, a real script. Um, also some cool things that came up during this hackathon was the, uh, idea of like a, a DLC marketplace. So sure bits, uh, I think Chris was talking about having, um, somebody do, potentially have like a marketplace where people could advertise that they're interested in, in participating in a certain DLC. And one way to kind of pre-screen people would be to challenge them to sign, uh, sign a message that says, Hey, I have this much funds and you know, I want to bet 300 Bitcoin on the presidential election. I will prove me you have 300 Bitcoin before you have a conversation. Um, and similarly with uh, liquidity ads for uh, lightning, kind of the same concept, just making sure that, uh, that people um, pre-screening, I guess. Right. So it's kind of like a pre-approval for a credit card. You still need to be approved later. Uh, but this is a step that you could take very early on in the process to weed out a lot of noise and, and build reputation systems. This also applies to users that are trying to do things like get a mortgage, get a loan, um, get a proof of credit lines that have Bitcoin. Um, ideally, you wouldn't have to sell your Bitcoin to fund your home purchase. You don't have to do that with your stocks. Um, so you can just say, hey, I have some Bitcoin, approve me for credit as that pre-screening, pre-approval -pre process. So there's been some work already done on this uh, a lot in the last year, actually. Um, so there's this uh, BIP, BIP322, which is written by Callie, uh, who's also the author of an application called BTC Dev, uh, Dev being debugger. Um, BIP322 is titled Generic Sign Messages. And the idea is that instead of signing a message, uh, as you currently do in Bitcoin, you just sign a script and you could sign any, any script that's compatible with Bitcoin. Um, so any, any company, anything that you could do like normally on Bitcoin, you could sign a transaction that would, wouldn't be valid to broadcast to the network. But it would verify that you actually have the keys and the script is signed properly. Um, ben Carmen also wrote an implementation of BIP322 in uh, Scala. Um, Will Abramson wrote a, a Jupyter notebook. And Christopher Allen at Blockchain Columns is currently working on a C++, C++ implementation. Uh, and then Steve mentioned to us the other day that there's a, a fellow associated with um, a bank in, in uh, Europe who's also working on BDK. Uh, named Richard, who wrote a uh, library called Proof of Reserves that's in, uh, I think it's in a branch of BDK right now. He is a, yeah, it's an add-on library, basically. An add a feature. And he gets all the feature, yeah, library. He gets all the credit for that. <laughs> okay, pretend those other names aren't up there. Uh, it's, just, it's just Richard. <laughs> um, but it's kind of important to note that BIP322 is still in a draft status, so it hasn't been approved. And the consequence of that is that all these lovely implementations people have worked on um, they're not all interoperable. So a lot of people have different opinions about how certain things should be formatted in the signature um, or in the script. So um, the BIP is not finalized, but there's like a lot of people working on it. So 
Uh, I'm optimistic about the future of 322. Also, just to just to back up, and I know everyone, most people here in this room are pretty technical, but just to maybe give a high level of why this might be important. Um, you know, Bitcoin transactions are like physical checks in the sense that they have it's a two step process. You have to sign the check, and then you have to take the check to the bank for funds to move. If you do any one of those two things, um, the funds don't move. So if you take if you have a signed check on your desk, that check is perfectly valid, but if you never take it to the bank, funds aren't moving and Conversely, if you take an unsigned check to the bank, it's not valid, so funds don't move. So the signature is the most important part of that. Um, that's frankly how Lightning works, right? There are a bunch of signed checks passed back and forth that never get taken to the bank. Um, so we're trying to basically exhaust the signature and verification analogy of a check to uh, to Bitcoin ownership. Yeah, exactly. Um, so so how does this actually work? Um, so in the this is some code for that Richard wrote that's uh, in that BDK feature. So um, the way this is different than a normal, it, it's structured like a PSBC. Uh, the key difference here is that um, in the uh, transaction input specification, the uh, uh, the previous TX out is invalid. Um, so that's how we know it's not a, a valid transaction that will end up being broadcast to the mempool. Um, so you could you know do a signature of a script that says you know I'm going to send Sam all of my Bitcoin, but if the TX in is invalid, then there's no risk of that transaction transaction actually happening. Um, and then because we're in taproot, uh, script sig is empty. So that gets all gets pushed, pushed to the, uh, the witness. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting to dive into the code here because I haven't fully seen how this stuff works under the, under the hood. Um, but there are just some differences between how BDK has done their implementation versus, uh, the other implementations that I mentioned. So, um, hopefully everybody can find some kind of consensus here. Um, but we went through and, uh, and, um, uh, well, Steve was kind enough to show us how the how the BDK library works. I can give you a quick demo of that. Um, so the the way this works is um, first thing you'd have to do in BDK. There's a CLI tool, which is really nice that I haven't used before. Um, so the first thing you would do is generate a new key, um, something like that. Um, this is on testnet, so. Uh, we're all safe here. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Please, please steal these seed words. <laughs> um, so, then we can use the. So this is a. a uh, so we can use the descriptor to generate a new address for our wallet, and we'll deposit some Bitcoin there, and then we'll uh, we'll essentially prove that we have those reserves uh, through this this little demo that we give. Hopefully, if things go okay. So we're going to use the Tapper descriptor. Uh, with the X priv that we just generated. Sorry, slash star. Oh, yeah. Okay. okay, so we have an address on testnet from it's a taproot address. We will uh, throw that into Bitcoin testnet faucet, and uh, we'll uh, solve a puzzle here for <laughs> Skynet. Just curious about motorcycles. <laughs> so Taproot or uh, testnet has been awesome lately. If it doesn't work, we have another wallet we can use, but. Uh, typically, it's been mining in just a couple of seconds here. So, uh, all right. So it's already unconfirmed. So, what we can do is uh, get ready to sync our wallet. Um, so, that's not how you spell sync. Um, so, just real quick, the the cool thing about um, this upgrade to or this the proposal Bit three twenty two to to message signing is that you can do it from any kind of Bitcoin address, any kind of transaction. Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of touched on that earlier, but it just seems like it's a like a huge loss lost feature in the Bitcoin world. And there's some criticism that it doesn't actually solve every problem there is because um, there's nothing that prevents me from asking Sam to sign something for me and then me pe passing that signature off as my own. Um, and the signature is also uh, technically only as good as um, as when it's published because I can move the funds, right? So I could sign a message, you could have a transaction, you could verify it. Um, but then I can move the funds, right? So you would need to have some kind of watchtower, sentinel service monitoring uh, that address to make sure that uh, they're not uh, cheating or otherwise defrauding the the reputation system. Um, yeah, 
Has anyone here used sign message before? <laughs> I'm just curious, what did you use it for? It's like a playground thing or was there an actual use case for it? Yeah, I mean, I thought, was, like, I thought the improvement reserves would just you sign any message with the key associated with that one. If you review the pub key, you see that's the hash on the chain and any message that you sign is implicitly like, I know that one. Uh, yeah, so, but you did that with Bitcoin Core's implementation? Interesting. I said it's proving you own the least private key, that one address. Yeah. It just proves that you had access to the private keys or someone that had the private keys. That's like technically yeah. literally what it what it is. Now, and I'll I'll show my company after, but uh, we have like heuristics around that. Yeah, it's, it could be a form of KYC in your Bitcoin too. Like, if so if you're in an exchange and uh, you want to withdraw it to a specific address, <laughs> then the exchange will say it will only let you withdraw it if you can like, like write this message. Yeah, there's this rule in uh, in some jurisdictions called the travel rule, yeah. where uh, certain exchanges require uh, like a lot of documentation. The government's required there be a lot of documentation around where funds are flowing. Um, so this could be useful for that. Um, all right, if this doesn't show up in a minute here, we'll just use the the old wallet. But did you run the command? No, I didn't, yeah, I didn't press enter. I'm waiting for. Uh, for a block to mine, you're just waiting on the mempool. That's why I'm stalling for time. <laughs> we can use the other wallet if this doesn't go through. Testnet's only fast when you're not using that. That's the way it works. Testnet does mine very quickly. So. Uh, what is this? <laughs> oh, okay. It looks like it's it's in the mempool, so it's showing up in our balance anyway. So. Even though it's not confirmed, we can still uh, potentially proceed here. So, um, so after we have some uh, Bitcoin in our wallet, we are going to use this BDK command called uh, produce um, proof. Produce proof. Yeah. So you produce proof with a challenge message. Um, so in this case, we're going to go with uh, any message you want. Uh, but you can imagine if like uh, you could automate a lot of this and have like an oracle that generates some kind of challenge messages and. Uh, or true random numbers, but we're going to go with uh, have uh, fun sting schnorr. Uh, uh, <laughs> even though it's not a schnorr signature, that's that's what we're going with. Um, so it generates this huge output, um, and at the end of it is a base64 PSBT, uh, which is kind of the critical part of this. Um, so now that we have this base64 PSBT, uh, this along with the other uh, kind of metadata is the only thing you would need to share with your counterparty to have them verify uh, your proof of funds. Uh, so then you can run this other command, um, which is BDK CLI external reserves uh, with the message. Um, you guys see? Oh, uh, yeah. Spelling's hard. followed by the PSBT. And then there's a uh, field for the number of confirmations um, and then the address that uh, that the funds are allegedly belonging to. Um, so again, error, because it's a live tech demo. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's the last, it's the last yeah, argument. It's oh, sorry. Yeah. True, it is a non-spendable input, yeah. So that's fine. I have another address we can confirm if this is... Uh, all right, we'll just go up in the, the log here to the last one. Uh, yeah. So, wait, wait. <laughs> well, if you're using, did you replace it with the new address? Uh, yeah, this is the new address. It was, uh, I think it was just have fun, though. Yeah, okay. So, this is what it looks like if a signature, if a proof of funds actually works. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, so, this is proof of funds for another address that I use. We can just show you what this address is on the, uh, the map pool. Yeah, so we have 10,000 10, sats here, and we get this confirmation that it's 10,000 spendable. I didn't write any of this. This is all Richard. I'm just learning how to use it. Uh, <laughs> so that's kind of the, the workflow here. So uh, a lot of what Sam and I worked on was talking through, like, what could this work look like in a business use case? And how would this fit into the work, like a user experience workflow? Um, and we worked on a couple of... Uh, 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 projects around that, but I don't think we have like a full implementation ready to show. Um, but this was the general concept of what we were going for. 
uh, in in one aspect, which is just creating a, an API that anybody could use uh, to verify signed messages um, using uh, either BDK's uh, reference implementation of this or any of the others that are out there that are BIP 322 compliant. Uh, there's another BIP 127 uh, that's called Proof of Reserves, but I haven't seen uh, too many PRs on it recently, so not sure what the current status of that is. Uh, but this is how we uh, a service that we're going to uh, follow up after this hackathon and build out like a verify script uh, API and, and make it open source and uh, just create like uh, some binaries that people can use to uh, verify messages with all the different implementations that are out there is uh, is the plan right now. Um, and then Sam, you want to talk about uh, yeah. what you're working on? Sure. So the objective was to wire this in, and we will wire it, wire it, and eventually can you stop sharing. Yes, but I can show you guys what it'll look like, what it can and should and will look like. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh oh. I think you're sharing it. No, it's a uh, permissions issue that I think now about. Oh, no. Cody, can you let me back in really quick? Um, so this is in a test environment. I forked our code. Um, and then I had our head of engineering yell at me yesterday because I broke a lot of stuff. So <laughs> it, it looks that this is also the first time anyone's seen this yet. So this is our, wow. this is our app. Um, it looks rough, like things are missing. So please don't judge it like this. It looks a lot better in production. Um, just for context, we have like a lenders and brokers tab where uh, again, I broke this, but there's a bunch of red pin drops of lenders and brokers that, we, that we're working with that will accept these statements that you can generate. But I'll show you right now how to verify uh, the signature of an address using Blue Wallet, for example. So you can connect your um, hardware devices, an exchange account. We have like 12 exchange integrations and then a s independent signature. So we give a challenge code here. I'll show you with Blue Wallet what it would look like theoretically. Uh, so if I'm in... So let's say I want to grab this address and I want to sign for this one specifically. Blue Wallet is one of the very few wallets that lets you actually sign and verify messages. So I'll put in this address. I'll put in the challenge code, uh, which is a message. I'll sign it and then I'll grab the signature, put it here and I'll grab the address that it corresponds to. I'll put that here. Verified, and I'll call this segwit uh, two, and that'll show up here. The zero balance. I guess I verified an address that I don't have any funds in. So, but this is what it would look like if you want to show it to like a lender or broker. Um, we have two reports. Level one report is just for your own personal information. It doesn't have your name or your physical address. Level two report will have your name and your physical address. It's got my actual physical address, so I know it's being recorded. I don't, or rather not put it up there. So <laughs> I'll show a level one report that doesn't. Um, and here you can select like different accounts that you want to include. So I'll include like this Trezor Testa, Testa wallet that I have and the SegWit account. Hopefully this doesn't take ages because it has been in this testing environment. But what it'll do is it'll send off that report to your email. You can add other emails that uh, I can fire it off to. And it'll also download the report locally on your computer. Eventually. Just going through like verifying the signature on those. They're already verified. So you're, you're just now generating a report, okay. um, like a bank statement that we'll see in a second. So here it is. Pull this up. And so this is what it looks like. Uh, we want to be a dumb zero knowledge proof. So these are random account numbers. We don't want a lender to see your address necessarily. They don't need to. Um, granted, if this is a B2B case, then they might need to, and that's fine because it's business to business. But as a retail customer, you shouldn't disclose any details unless you absolutely have to or are willing to. So by default, we just have random account numbers, your deposit history, deposits and withdrawals. Um, 
And for someone who is not familiar with the crypto or Bitcoin industry at all, seeing a statement like this gives them some degree of comfort because it looks like other statements they, they look at previously. So this is the most primitive sort of dumb way to do it. Uh, we have a lot of features that we're releasing pretty soon that'll make this more interactive and more uh, programmatic. Uh, but if you do want to get a loan or want to try it, um, this, is, this, is, this is how you would do it today. The question, that's it. <laughs> Steven. I got three questions. Uh oh. Yeah, two are sort of meta questions. Okay. Project all at once. One is more like technical about how you actually get something. Part of all the Hosek stuff was created for Packet Fund, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's not part of it. It's not, it's not wired in. Okay. Yeah. Question number two. Uh, so, uh, the generic sign messages, um, so like I saw you were using some tapper descriptors. Okay. Is this something that's like specific to tapper or will this be, this be generalizable to pretty much anything? It's generalizable and it's it's much better than the current verify message because you can use uh, any any valid script. You can also do partially signed Bitcoin transactions, which lets you uh, coordinate with other people. Um, so you can do like a multi sig or sign from a federation, potentially uh, meet any kind of threshold that you need to. So like frost and roast, or if you're on a side chain like Liquid and periodically you want to you know let the public know that you actually have your keys, you could uh, sign a, a, a dummy transaction like this. Um, so there's there's a lot of weird use cases like that. Uh, uh, yes, it is. Yeah. So I'm just curious. I'm just curious to understand the mechanism of like how it works. Like if it's if it's a finalized PSPT, like how does like I wouldn't want to send that to someone. So like instead of so like what are what do you actually send this out as proof? Yeah. So you actually do send the PSPT, um, and it's not dangerous to send it, even though it is finalized. Because uh, uh, I am not the most technical person in the world, so someone correct me if I say something wrong here. I'm not going to be embarrassed. But my understanding of it, from having chatted with a number of people who are much smarter than me, is that if the PSBT, everything in it is is like a normal valid PSBT, and you sign it, except the TX uh, t t transaction input, uh, it, in the transaction input, there's like five fields. If the previous TX out is not a valid TX out then uh, the mempool will reject it and it can't actually be spent. Um, so everything about it looks normal and you can, and it will look like a normal Bitcoin transaction. But when it hits the mempool, it'll just go nowhere and, and die. Okay, that's interesting. So it's a transaction that like proves you validly signed for the fact that you have your funds, but will guarantee you always be rejected. So you, ba you basically, you know, signed a voided check. It's kind of the way to think about it. That's the way of putting it. Yeah. You watch the address. Yeah, so those are those are some of the features that we're releasing, for example. So they'll be, you know, if anything happens, they'll they'll know. If you do move funds, they they will know. And in, in BDK's implementation, you can also also specify that um, uh, you can specify that the proof isn't legitimate until there's a certain number of tra uh, confirmations. Um, so that, that could help there too, uh, just in terms of like you can specify whatever blocked up you want to prevent like reorg. You can also set the lock time. So if it's a transaction output yeah. that has a lock time, so like two years from now, and you get a signature from that, and that says, yes, I control this, and I can't move it for the next two years. Yeah, that's a different use case. Yeah, 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 exactly. Although I think you said yesterday, Ramon, that's not what the banks require. They don't require that now. Yeah, like yeah. it's like if you show a bank statement from May, they just know you had it for a month. Depends on the use. So like for a mortgage, for example, uh, you have to season your funds, which is what they do today with your yacht and banks and, and your bank account. Um, they just don't want your mom to send you like half a million dollars and then you send it out once you're approved. So they need the funds to be there for a certain amount of time. They treat this the same way. They just want to know that you've had the funds historically for a certain amount of time they before they actually... Lock down I mean, like, I, I think they're I, not, I send it to the lock time. You know that I can't do it for the next two years. Uh, my friend is going to do the job. Your postcards have to be any lock time they 
In perpetuity, correct, okay. correct. Okay. But again, it also depends on. Until this, until escrow closes, like don't put that money. Yeah. Like, don't, don't, right. There could be like the use case of having more money. Going on that, and nobody actually has any ability to access that money. Like, you know, like the money. Yeah. Yeah, and. Well, and people that haven't spent too much time in this country also don't have credit history. They have their Bitcoin, so they don't have anything to leverage. The objective here also is to not uh, allow you or not to promote um, the idea that you can get a loan based on your Bitcoin ownership only. Like we want to build to that. But your Bitcoin ownership should play as a key data point in your overall credit worthiness, like your other financial data points. But right now, you don't have a way to do that. Any other questions?